We are here uh, at the quarry site. Very, very special place where we are excavating fossils uh, of uh, Cambrian age, which are about 500 million years. And uh, we are excavating layer by layer. I'm Jean-Bernard Caron. I'm a, a curator of uh, invertebrate paleontology at the Royal Ontario Museum. These uh, layers basically record uh, episodes of uh, mass mortality events of uh, uh, communities of animals that live at the bottom of the ocean at the time. Wow, wow look at this. Oh. Beautiful. Wow. And they were buried very quickly, dramatically, and catastrophically. So uh, all the organs that they, these animals uh, contain are still preserved uh, in, in stunning quality. Today we found actually a specimen which shows beautifully uh, the eyes and the, the, the brain of that organism. The Canadian Rockies are a magical place, and the Burgess Shale is uh, legendary. Did you check in here? My name is Robert Gaines. I'm a professor of geology at Pomona College in Claremont, California. You might find it unusual that seabeds are comprising the mountains here, but uh, that's the action of much later mountain building. Uh, so uh, although these rocks were, are some half a billion years old or 500 million years old, the, uh, the age of the uplift of the, of the Rockies is, uh, goes back to only about 100 million years old. The sea that covered uh, all of North America was into Saskatchewan, certainly by this time that the Burgess Shell was deposited. In most places, it was only a few meters to a few tens of meters deep, a very shallow ocean. Uh, but here in the Burgess Shell, we have an area where we're approaching the edge of North America at the time, and we have a, a drop off into a basin, which was really key to uh, the animals, their habitat, and also their preservation. There's probably like at least 15 different species of organisms preserved at the same time. Many fossils here occur along the same layer, which uh, record a single event of burial of all these animals. And it's interesting, we find pairs of these species together certainly um, add a, a social behavior and certainly, uh, you know, present re this represents an important record of ecology. And this site yields far better preserved specimens, far more specimens, and so we're going to be able to revisit our interpretation of this early fish, which really connects all of us, uh, the vertebrates with the mammals, the reptiles, the amphibians. They all bring, uh, come down to this particular fish at some point in their evolution. We do explorations routinely to find out where the Burgess Shale is well exposed. Ooh! Attends, la lumière, wow! Sometimes it's very easy uh, when we're walking across these slopes to find fossils spread across the hills in, in the rocks. Uh, and then it's my job as the geologist to track those back up higher into the mountain face and determine precisely the layers where they're coming. Joe, is he coming? Yeah. There's not a lot of days, even at the Burgess Shale, where we can make the kind of discoveries that we made today. My name is Joe Moisiek, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and the Royal Ontario Museum. This has the, the marking here, so there should be right, right. One of the things that I was most excited about was this discovery of a complete specimen of an animal called Cambro raster, which was actually the first species that I got to name. Uh, and it's very rare to find these things complete. We only have a couple of examples uh, previously found, and this one is just remarkable looking. We call it Cambro raster falcatus, which means the, uh, the, the first part of the name means the Cambrian rake, which is in reference to the frontal claws on this animal, which look like rakes, and we think it would have used them to probe through the sediment in search of buried food. And then the second part of the name falcatus refers to the fact that this thing has this really unique looking head shield that looks a lot like the Millennium Falcon spaceship. So we gave a little nod to that. There's something going into the wall. I was always one of these bug kids that was pulling up rocks. And so fortunately at the Royal Ontario Museum, they have this um, periodic fossil identification clinic. And so I brought in some of these things that I was finding. I was probably about seven or eight at the time. And then over the years, I just got more and more into the fossil. I'm in the last year of my PhD right now. So I will be moving on somewhere for a postdoc and later hopefully some kind of a job in academia. I find very important to train the new generation of scientists and paleontologists in this case. Oh, it's probably a, an interrupted swarm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, turbank. 
should probably keep this. And I think it's very uh, important to realize that there's still a lot of research areas to, uh, to explore and uh, one person cannot do everything. Couper ça. I'm super thankful to Jean Bernard for all of the opportunities that he's given me in the field to, to make these discoveries in the first place and then also to work on the material that we found as well as some of the older collections at the ROM. Science is a, a field that is constantly trying to improve on itself and so part of the legacy that you leave as a researcher is your students. You want to peel that part off? Yeah, go for it. Our field is pretty small and it is essential, I think, that we have as many different viewpoints as possible. And there's so many different fossils to be worked on here. It's not like uh, Jean Bernard could do all of the descriptions of the fossils all by himself. And as he trains new students and new researchers, they come with their own points of view. They are taking classes in biology that are more up to date. Uh, they have a good understanding of the groups they're working on. And they find, they see new features. They ask different questions. Everyone's perspective is different. And sometimes that's really important in opening new doorways. The next generation is really prepared to answer different questions and new kinds of questions.